Radio Westeros, Episode 78, The Children of the Forest. Spoilers all books! Hello and welcome to another episode of Radio Westeros. I'm one of your hosts, Yoke Boy, and with me, as always, is Lady Gwen. Yeah, hi everyone, and thanks for joining us today. Following our recent episodes on dragons and the others, today we'll be concluding our look at A Song of Ice and Fire's mysterious species with this new episode all about the children of the forest, skin changers, and green seers. And we want to begin with a word about language and the naming of this fascinating species. We're well aware that children of the forest is the name given to them by human invaders into their territory and that their name for themselves roughly translated from the true tongue, which no human can speak, is those who sing the song of Earth. In fact, in A Dance with Dragons, once Bran is informed of what they call themselves, he gradually stops referring to them as children and picks up their preferred terminology, the singers. Perhaps in future installments, like Bran, the people of Westeros will also learn to use the singers. But as this is fiction, and Children of the Forest is the name which readers and listeners will commonly recognize and use, and since all of the histories and lessons that form the source material and quotes we use in this episode use that human terminology, we've decided to hew to the name George uses most on page in order to avoid confusion. So today we'll begin by considering who the Children of the Forest are and what makes them a unique and intriguing part of George's world. Then we'll give the children some context by taking a close look at their history from the Dawn Age to the coming of the First Men to the Long Night to the Andal Invasion. We'll summarise tens of thousands of years of existence asking questions like what was the children's relationship with the giants like in Proto-Westeros? How did they deal with the stream of first men crossing the Arm of Dawn? What happened with the Hammer of the Waters cataclysm that's said to have shattered the landscape itself? And who are the mysterious green men apparently alive and well on the Isle of Faces? Next, we'll consider if some of the children's magic, skin changing, green dreaming, and green seeing, are a matter of blood, and ponder how such abilities found their way into human characters like Bran Stark. The children are said to have grown close to the Kranigmen thousands of years ago, so we'll be exploring exactly what that might mean. Then we'll delve deep into the culture and magics of the children and look at those iconic weirwood trees sacred to their society and the religion of the old gods. Why do the children value them so highly? How do they connect to green seeing? And what can we glean from the lessons Bloodraven teaches Bran in that cave beyond the wall? Finally, we'll consider the children of the forest in the current story and ponder the notion that the ghost of High Heart might be related to them. We'll take a crackpot theory look at who her parents could be. This episode will be full of wonder and mystery, and if you love the children, weirwoods, the old gods, skin-changing, mysteries and intrigue, then boy, do we have the episode for you. But before we begin today's episode, we want to take a moment to thank our patrons. Radio Westeros is supported by patrons, and our heartfelt thanks go to our Flaming Lightbringer patron, TJ Harrington, our Dragonsteel patron, Peter, and our Pale as Milk Glass patrons, Alex. Akka in the Company of the Cats, Crispy the Song of Ice, Seth, Kelly, Laura, Sister Winter, Moltude, John Wargarian, and Empty Walls, first of his name, as well as B-Word and Mr. J, the Bear and the Maiden Fair, and Sir Tim of House Jib-Jab Hot Dog Shop, house motto, we forge the chains we wear in life. And if you want to support the podcast, head on over to patreon.com slash Radio Westeros, and you could be getting early access to episodes, personalized shoutouts, and more. Thank you to all of our patrons. We couldn't do this without you. And now it's time to get started with the Children of the Forest and Greenseers. The Children of the Forest made their home simply, constructing no holdfasts or castles or cities. Instead, they resided in the woods, in crannogs, in bogs and marshes, and even in caverns and hollow hills. It is said that, in the woods, they made shelter of leaves and withies up in the branches of the trees. Secret tree towns. 
In previous episodes on Dragons and the Others, we explored Song of Ice and Fire's most famous mythical beings, beginning with their appearance, powers, and the influences George was drawing from in their designs. But there's another species that belongs in the same bracket with regards to their magical abilities and massive influence on the story, the Children of the Forest. While, like the others, glimpses of the children have been limited, their impact on George's world cannot be overstated. By the time Bran finally sets eyes on one in a dance with dragons, we are already well aware of their history, having been fed trickles of information from as early as Bran I of A Game of Thrones, where our POV noted that his father Ned would sometimes tell tales of the children of the forest. However, in the second chapter of Game of Thrones, Catelyn 1, we learn that the children were thought to be extinct by other characters in story. Catelyn finds herself in the Winterfell Godswood, thinking, Ned had built a small sept where she might sing to the seven faces of God, but the blood of the first men still flowed in the veins of the Starks, and his own gods were the old ones, the nameless, faceless gods of the Greenwood they shared with the vanished children of the forest. And so the reader is left to ponder from that early stage whether the children really are extinct or whether they're hiding in some remote area of the map away from civilization. And so it's a great moment five books later when we are introduced to a real living child of the forest in Bran's POV. Seen at first through Hodor's eyes in a moment of chaos, Leif reminds him of his sister Aya on account of her stature and appearance. It says she was a scrawny thing, ragged, wild, her hair a tangle. Soon we get a more detailed description of Leaf from Bran. That was not Arya's voice, nor any child's. It was a woman's voice, high and sweet, with a strange music in it like none that he had ever heard, and a sadness that he thought might break his heart. Bran squinted to see her better. It was a girl, but smaller than Arya, her skin dappled like a doe's beneath a cloak of leaves. Her eyes were queer, large and liquid, golden green, slitted like a cat's eyes. No one has eyes like that. Her hair was a tangle of brown and red and gold, autumn colors with vines and twigs and withered flowers woven through it. While this description is fairly short, it covers a lot of ground in one paragraph. It puts a vivid picture in our heads of the species. Initially mistaken for Aya, she has basic humanoid qualities like two arms and legs, and Bran is immediately able to identify her as a girl. She has a mess of hair described as autumnal, giving us the impression of a folk deeply connected to flora. But there are also features that are less human. Leaf seems fully grown but is small with dappled, doe-like skin. Her eyes are more like an animal's, large and strange and cat-like. When we talked about the others, we discussed how George made them seem both human and inhuman at the same time. There's something intriguing about a mystical species who are simultaneously relatable and different from ourselves. Here, George uses the same trick again, but rather than the elemental influence of ice, the children embody another aspect of nature. Fire for dragons, ice for others, earth for the children. But the design of the children isn't purely aesthetic and conceptual. We learn in Bran 3 of A Dance with Dragons that their eyes were big too, great golden cat's eyes that could see down passages where a boy's eyes saw only blackness. Likewise, they have, quote, large ears that could hear things no man could hear. The children's physical attributes again put them close to nature. And neither does George want us to think of the children as literal children, naive, cute, and immature. Bran thinks... Though the men of the Seven Kingdoms might call them the children of the forest, Leif and her people were far from childlike. And in fact, Leif even says, Men, they are the children. With what we know about man's destruction of these folk, and having witnessed the endless wars ravaging Westeros, Leif simultaneously elevates our perception of her species and crushes the notion of humans as inherent good guys in five words. There's more to her people than meets the eye. 
Throughout A Dance with Dragons, we get further descriptions in Bran's POV chapters that reiterate their important features and add some others. It says, They were small compared to men, as a wolf is smaller than a dire wolf. That does not mean it is a pup. They had nut brown skin dappled like a deer's with paler spots. Their hands had only three fingers and a thumb with sharp black claws instead of nails. And they did sing. They sang in true tongue, so Bran could not understand the words, but their voices were as pure as winter air. This last observation from Bran about them being actual singers is a reference to their real name in the true tongue, those who sing the Song of Earth. True tongue is their native language, which the world book says originated or drew inspiration from the sounds they heard every day and probably shared much of its beauty. In a brief passage about Brandon the Builder learning to interact with the children, it says, Brandon could not at first understand their speech, which was described as sounding like the song of stones in a brook, or wind through the leaves, or the rain upon the water. So this reminds us of the others, whose speech sounded to Will like the cracking of ice on a winter lake, only it's less terrifying and perhaps more beautiful. And the children's melancholy voices aren't just there for beauty, but serve to remind us of the decimation at human hands. When describing their speech as sounding sad enough to break Bran's heart, George dispels any notion of them being happy little forest elves. In A Game of Thrones, Maester Lewin lets us know that far from being passive, adorable creatures, in reality they armed themselves with sharp weapons. He tells Bran, The children of the forest hunted with obsidian thousands of years ago. The children worked no metal. In place of mail, they wore long shirts of woven leaves and bound their legs in bark, so they seemed to melt into the wood. In place of swords, they carried blades of obsidian. While Lewin couches this early lesson to Bran about their capabilities in terms of hunting, as we know, and we'll discuss in much greater depth shortly, they actually used their primitive arms and armor to engage in a generations-long war with the first men to protect their homeland and sacred trees. And when Bran says, tell me more about the children in A Game of Thrones, Lewin's recounting of their history is as much for the reader's benefit as Bran's. In this valuable moment of exposition, we get this information about the children and their culture. They were a people dark and beautiful, small of stature, no taller than children, even when grown to manhood. They lived in the depths of the wood, in caves and crannogs and secret tree towns. Slight as they were, the children were quick and graceful. Male and female hunted together with weirwood bows and flying snares. Their gods were the gods of forest, stream and stone, the old gods whose names are secret. Their wise men were called green seers and carved strange faces in the weirwoods to keep watch on the woods. How long the children reigned here, or where they came from, no man can know. So, overall, we get a picture of a devastated species living a sort of animistic lifestyle on the fringes of civilization, in harmony with nature. As a fictional species, they complement the others and dragons, offering something a little different, but maintaining a high level of intrigue. But while George should be credited for the children's uniqueness, their design is rooted in the mythology and literature that influenced him. So let's consider where George was getting his ideas from. In our recent episode on the others, we noted the fact that George had described them as looking like the she from Irish mythology. And so perhaps Irish mythology is a good starting point when discussing the influences behind the children of the forest. According to Gaelic legend, the two Harde Danann were a supernatural race of ancient inhabitants in Ireland. They are associated with the Shi, perhaps even an earlier iteration of that species, and have the ability to live in both the other world and the human world, wielding magical powers. And these powers included the ability to shapeshift, not dissimilar to the children's talent for skin changing, which we'll be discussing shortly. They had a strong godlike influence on nature and are believed to represent pagan deities associated with the Irish landscape. 
In the earliest accounts of the Tua de Denen, they are referred to as the Tua de, which translates as tribe of gods. This again puts us in mind of the children who are inextricably linked to nature and whose green seers might actually be considered the old gods in light of what we later learn about them. According to the 9th century Gaelic tale, The Taking of the Fairy Mound, early Gaelic settlers in Ireland could only successfully raise crops if they first endeared themselves to the Tua Dei and harnessed their magic. This reminds us of how the children initially welcomed and aided the first men. Finally, to further this comparison, the Tuadé inhabited Ireland before humans and attempted to fend off waves of invaders. Eventually, they were defeated by the Milesians and subsequently retreated back to the other world and disappeared into the hills. In modern tellings, they became associated with the fairy stories common to Irish mythology. To this day, there are local superstitions about fairies residing in oak, ash and hawthorn trees, and some local mythology enthusiasts consider these trees sacred. With the children also attempting to fend off human settlers and eventually retreating to the fringes of the world, and considering their connection to magical trees, there are some strong parallels between them and the Tuadei. But of course, George doesn't take influences and replicate them like for like. While the imprint of Irish mythology is clear, there's much borrowed from tropes and archetypes of wood elves that Tolkien had also employed, piskies from British mythology and nature spirits found in myths and literature all over the world. With the concept of weirwoods drawing heavily from Norse mythology and the world tree Yggdrasil, George evidently enjoys patching together a mishmash of influences when designing his world and its inhabitants. And one way George makes a fictional species his own is by granting them magical superpowers. Here he can pull in fantasy elements from that side of his brain and mix them in with the historical and mythological designs to create something new and memorable. He didn't just make the others she but the she made of ice, with fantastical powers to control cold and raise the undead as an army. Again, he's followed that formula with the children. They have magical abilities that seem to be passed on by blood as well as other dark magic. And speaking of the magic in their blood, we see there are three categories of magic, skin changing, green sight, and green seeing. Skin changing is the ability to inhabit the minds of animals and even humans to control their bodies. It's a concept we should be familiar with because we see Arya and Bran Stark, Jon Snow, and Varamyr Sixkins all inhabit animals in their POVs. Skin changing a wolf is called warging. As George put it in a fan correspondence in 2000, a warg is bound to a wolf. Skin changer is a more general term. All wargs are skin changers, but not all skin changers are wargs. While the ability to skin change in humans is rare, we can't be certain of how many children of the forest are able to do this. But we know some of them do because Maester Lewin tells Bran in A Clash of Kings that supposedly the Greenseers also had power over the beasts of the wood and the birds in the trees, even fish. Although we only see skin changing through a human perspective, it's plain to see how this ability would be of great benefit to a species living a life in nature. Yeah, we see Aurel of the Free Folk inhabiting an eagle to spy on his foe. From the air, one can see the lay of the land and gather important intelligence on reconnaissance missions. Imagine the advantages this ability gave the children in trying to fend off the First Men and the Andals. They could also look for friends and allies out in the open or hunt and bring prey back to their real body without ever having to move. We also see Varamir Sixkin sitting comfortably on his snow bear. Similarly, the children would be able to use animals to transport themselves without breaking a sweat. This would make traversing difficult terrain easier and allow longer journeys over land. And when Aya escapes Harrenhal and her direwolf Nymeria kills the bloody mummers sent in pursuit, we see the potential for skin changers to use their animals as weapons. 
Wolves, direwolves, bears and birds of prey are among the wild animals that could be skin changed to inflict massive damage on a foe. We wonder how many andals got bitten or clawed to death. But there's also the ability to skin change more advanced species, as we saw with Bran jumping into Hoder when he's in the cave. Could a skin changer with strong abilities potentially take over a high-ranking enemy and see through their eyes or even set them against their own men? Again, we wonder what sort of tricks were being pulled against those invaders they were at war with. It's an impossible skill to defend against because accomplished skin changers seem to be able to work at long distances. So, providing they weren't bound by taboos against such things, the children could potentially inhabit humans or even giants and create all kinds of chaos. Finally, aside from the logistical and military advantages the children could gain from skin changing, there's also the sheer pleasure of being so closely bound to nature. In times of peace, they could bond with animals and see the world through their eyes, glide over the landscape in a falcon, swim through a stream as a salmon, or explore dense forest as a wolf. Those of you who have had close bonds with your cats and dogs and other pets know how satisfying it can be to connect with animals. Well-trained skin changers could have gone on incredible, fulfilling adventures without leaving the safety of their homes. Then there's another type of magic called green sight. Although it sounds similar to green seeing, and there's heaps of overlap, green sight is a distinct ability. With green sight, a person experiences green dreams, which are prophetic visions of the future. Bran's close companion, Jojen Reed, experiences these green dreams, and judging from his experiences, they seem to be heavily symbolic snippets of the future that can be true, yet difficult to interpret. As Mira Reed puts it to Bran, My brother has the green sight. He dreams things that haven't happened, but sometimes they do. In The Clash of Kings, Jojen describes one of his green dreams. He tells Bran... I dreamed of a winged wolf bound to earth with grey stone chains, he said. It was a green dream, so I knew it was true. A crow was trying to peck through the chains, but the stone was too hard and his beak could only chip at them. In response, Bran asked, Did the crow have three eyes? And it says, Jojen nodded. So, this dream seems to be a symbolic account of Bloodraven's efforts to assist Bran's green potential. We can see Bran represented as the winged wolf, and the three-eyed crow, who we later learn as Bloodraven, is trying his best to release the chains preventing Bran, who cannot walk, from flying. We can imagine the children of the forest experiencing green dreams and glimpsing moments of the future that they had to decipher, given that prophetic dreams have caused so many problems in Westeros, such as Targaryens driven to mad deeds due to their dragon dreams. It's difficult to say whether green dreams were a help or a hindrance for the children. But still, they're a magical and intriguing aspect of the children and may have served as a rung in the ladder for those with the potential to become green seers. Green sight is related to green seeing, but not precisely the same thing. When Bran asks Jojen to mentor him in green matters in a storm of swords, he says, You're a green seer. No, said Jojen, only a boy who dreams. The green seers were more than that. They were wargs as well as you are, and the greatest of them could wear the skins of any beast that flies or swims or crawls, and could look through the eyes of the weirwoods as well, and see the truth that lies beneath the world. Here, Jojen indicates what is unique about green seers, that they can see through the carved weirwood trees sacred to the old gods. As if being able to look through a network of tree cameras wasn't enough of a boon, Maester Gandel tells us in the World Book that, quote, legend further holds that the green seers could also delve into the past and see far into the future. And when Bloodraven eventually mentors Bran in the cave beyond the wall, he gives a lot of exposition to green seeing. He tells Bran, 
Once you have mastered your gifts, you may look where you will and see what the trees have seen, be it yesterday or last year or a thousand ages past. Men live their lives trapped in an eternal present between the mists of memory and the sea of shadow that is all we know of the days to come. Certain moths live their whole lives in a day, yet to them that little span of time must seem as long as years and decades do to us. An oak may live three hundred years, a redwood tree three thousand. A weirwood will live forever if left undisturbed. To them seasons pass in a flutter of a moth's wing, and past, present and future are one. And so, being able to see the past, present, and future through the weirwood's eyes is an incredible power. When Bloodraven adds that accomplished greenseers can see beyond the trees, meaning that they are not limited to weirwood vision, he's essentially describing the power of an all-seeing, omniscient eye. The advantages, not to mention the intrigue of seeing everywhere and through time, cannot be overstated. Yet we should keep in mind that such a great power is also susceptible to folly and abuse. To understand the dangers inherent to green seeing, one need only look at Melisandre's oft mistaken attempts to read the future in her flames, about which she told John, I can speak to kings long dead and children not yet born and watch the years and seasons flicker past until the end of days. While this echoes Yandel's claims about green seers, the frequency with which she is either wrong or her interpretation leads to an undesired outcome are probably a good indicator of the perils inherent in interpreting visions of any sort. And while Bloodraven insists that, quote, the past remains the past, we can learn from it, but we cannot change it. It remains to be seen whether Bran, who might turn out more powerful than his mentor, will try to meddle with the timeline. Giving his hijacking of Hodor's mind, we can see that he's perhaps a little young and immature to have a full grasp of the implications of his godlike powers. Altogether, the children of the forest possess fascinating abilities of skin changing, green dreaming, and green seeing. It's a shame we haven't yet really seen the children themselves wielding these powers, but they do seem to have passed them on to humans for the reader to witness up close. This magical aspect makes us desperate to know more about them, adds a fascinating new layer to the world building, and filters through to the human story in a very key way. While they themselves remain on the periphery, their influence is front and center. And aside from these green abilities, the children also seem to possess dark magic capable of even smashing land to pieces. But we'll save that story for later, because first we need to give this species some historical context. Up next, we'll take a look at the children of the forest from the Dawn Age through the Age of Heroes. They were a people of the Dawn Age, the very first, before kings and kingdoms. In those days, there were no castles or holdfasts, no cities, not so much as a market town to be found between here and the Sea of Dawn. There were no men at all, only the children of the forest dwelt in the lands we now call the Seven Kingdoms. Before the advent of modern geological proofing methods, no one on Earth could hazard a scientifically-based guess as to how old the world was. In Westeros, George has his maesters follow the same pattern. Maester Yandel says, There are none who can say with certain knowledge when the world began, yet this has not stopped many maesters and learned men from seeking the answer. Is it 40,000 years old, as some hold, or perhaps a number as large as 500,000, or even more? It is not written in any book that we know, for in the first age of the world, the Dawn Age, men were not lettered. So, with such a glaring lack of information, speculating on the prehistory of Planetos is troublesome, and we should be aware of the large gaps in information either lost to time or never known at all. 
However, despite the primitive science and scant records, there is some amount of information given in the world book and scattered through the main text about the first known age. As this is fictional and not the real world, it's a fair bet that what information exists does so for a reason. George wants to give an impression of, and hints about, earlier times without giving away every little secret and spoiling all the mysteries. And so, Maester Yandel gives us a vague picture of what was going on in Westeros tens of thousands of years ago during an era called the Dawn Age. As the name suggests, the Dawn Age was the first known era of Westerosi history, a time before men had crossed the Arm of Dorne into Westeros. There's no way of knowing how long this era lasted or what came before. It's possible the Dawn Age lasted for tens of thousands of years, and there might have been a long preceding era of prehistory and evolution. But what we do know is that somewhere around 12,000 years before the events of the main story, the first men began to settle in Westeros, marking a significant plot point in the continent's history. Before the First Men, it seems Westeros was inhabited by two intelligent species, the Children and the Giants. Without the interference and aggression of man, the two coexisted together in Westeros in a time Yandel, with his human prejudice, refers to as primitive and uncivilised. While it's tempting to assume the two peoples lived in some sort of blissful harmony, there is evidence to the contrary. The giants were, quote, huge and powerful creatures, but simple. They ranged where they could and took what they wanted, living uneasily alongside the children. And there are other sources, unnamed by Yandel, that claim the children's greatest foe were the giants, citing a giant's burial with obsidian arrowheads found amidst the extant ribs. However, even with evidence of the children and giants being at odds, there's no suggestion of massive, widespread warfare as seen when the children fought the first men. The inclusion of details such as a giant killed by the children serves to demonstrate once more that they are not innocent, bouncing forest sprites, but a complex species capable of conflict and violence. George's design of the giants and children is one of contrasts. Yandel tells us, The children of the forest were, in many ways, the opposites of the giants. As small as children, but dark and beautiful, they lived in a manner we might call crude today, yet they were still less barbarous than the giants. They worked no metal, but they had great art in working obsidian what the small folk call dragonglass, while the Valyrians knew it by a word meaning frozen fire to make tools and weapons for hunting. They wove no cloths, but were skilled in making garments of leaves and bark. They learned to make bows of weirwood and to construct flying snares of grass, and both of the sexes hunted with these. So given the differences between the two species, it's interesting to consider them living together on a continent for an undetermined but extensive period of time. The giants would have used their brute strength, perhaps arming themselves with crude weapons like tree stump clubs they could swing and throw. In close combat, the children would be vulnerable to being hit and crushed to death. However, small as they were, they were also quick and nimble. The giants call them Wodak Nagram, which translates to little squirrel people, so we can imagine them climbing trees and hiding in the canopy. The threat of the giants might even be the reason they chose to inhabit woodland to begin with, given being out in the open would give them less places to retreat. And as we saw in the last segment, we can't forget their green seers. As leaders of the children, the green seers could wield their powers to great effect, warging animals from the safety of the treetops to spy, track, and fight, as we mentioned. We can imagine the cumbersome giant's frustrations in trying to catch the children and defend against skin-changed animals. The contrast between the species works to great effect in such imaginings. But although Yandel hints at the evidence of their conflict, Who knows how often they came to blows? A single giant body 
filled with obsidian arrowheads, tells a story, but does it tell the whole story? If the children and giants lived together on Westeros for tens of thousands of years, possibly even longer, one body is a small sample size. Was there cooperation between the two species? Did they have periods of harmony? Were offerings made? It's not a perfect comparison because they're not a different species, but the Night's Watch are enemies to the Free Folk, yet there are still trades and understandings that add complexity to their relationship. Perhaps the relationship between giants and the children carried a similar nuance not recorded in the scant history books written millennia after the fact. But one fact we can be sure of is that the giants were not enough of a threat to the children to stop them spreading far and wide. As Yandel puts it, there is no doubt that they could once be found from the lands of always winter to the shores of the summer sea. Yet the view that the children evolved on Westeros and remained on that continent seems to have been dispelled by the world book. In the section on Ib, it says, The god kings of Ib, before their fall, did succeed in conquering and colonizing a huge swath of northern Essos, immediately south of Ib itself, a densely wooded region that had formerly been the home of a small, shy forest folk. Some say that the Ebenese extinguished this gentle race, while others believed they went into hiding in the deeper woods or fled to other lands. The Dothraki still called the great forest along the northern coast the Kingdom of the Ephaquevron, the name by which they knew the vanished forest dwellers. And we even get further accounts of these forest dwellers from a couple of Westerosi sources, as Yandel tells us that the fabled sea snake, Corlys Valerian, Lord of the Tides, was the first Westerosi to visit these woods. After his return from the Thousand Islands, he wrote of carved trees, haunted grottoes, and strange silences. A later traveler, the merchant adventurer Brian of Old Town, captain of the cog Spearshaker, provided an account of his own journey across the Shivering Sea. He reported that the Dothraki name for the lost people meant those who walk in the woods. None of the Ibanese that Brian of Old Town met could say that they had ever seen a woods walker, but claimed that the little people blessed a household that left offerings of leaf and stone and water overnight. And if a mysterious species of tree-carving, woodwalking little people is sounding familiar, we are also told they had significant powers of some sort. Yandel says, The horse lords had hitherto shunned the forests of the northern coasts. Some say this was because of their reverence for the vanished woodwalkers, others because they feared their powers. We've seen up close how fearless and aggressive the Dothraki can be, and that their respect has to be earned in bloody combat, as we saw in the tale of the 3,000 Unsullied defending Kohor. So, what made the Dothraki fear or respect these woodwalkers? What happened to make the Karls decide to avoid an entire species and a massive area of the map? Yeah, it does point to the woodwalkers having powers that both impressed and unnerved the belligerent Dothraki, keeping in mind that Dothraki culture, like the Mongols of real history, revolves around horses. Is it possible the woodwalkers began skin-changing Dothraki mounts? One way to really scare the Dothraki people would be to mess with their horses, because that would take their power away. And finally, in the Grasslands section of the World Book, we learn that even the usually sceptical Maesters believe that the Ephaquevron were related to the children of the forest. It says, In the forest to the north, along the shores of the Shivering Sea, were the domains of the Woodswalkers, a diminutive folk who many Maesters believe to have been kin to the children of the forest. And so, if the Ifiquevron were related to the children, as seems highly likely, many questions arise. Were they the exact same species, different branches of the same species, or was one the ancestor of the other? Does the existence of proto-children in Essos hint that they first existed there and made their way to Westeros over time? Or was it the other way around? 
Sadly, there's one detail that limits our excitement at the evidence of an SOC version of the Children of the Forest. Given that the Dothraki refer to their last settlement as Vais Lisai, translating to City of Ghosts, added to the fact they are repeatedly referred to as vanished, it seems the species are either extinct or living in small numbers on the fringes somewhere as they are in Westeros. Did the Ebonies really extinguish them? And if not, where did they retreat to? Given the conflict the children have faced throughout history with giants, Ibanese, Dothraki, and, as we're going to see, First Men and later Andals, it's perhaps no wonder why they lived in the woods and put so much emphasis on their sacred trees that it became their religion. They were so physically vulnerable, they must have had to depend on the power of their green seers to give them an advantage in their struggle to survive. And speaking of surviving, up next, we're going to explore what happened when humans arrived in Westeros and entered the children's territory. Look in your fires, Pink Priest, and you will see. Not now, though. Not here. You'll see nothing here. This place belongs to the old gods still. They linger here as I do, shrunken and feeble, but not yet dead. Nor do they love the flames, for the oak recalls the acorn. The acorn dreams the oak. The stump lives in them both. And they remember when the first men came with fire in their fists. After a long period of coexistence in what would eventually be called Westeros, the giants and children were joined by a race of men. The first men to cross the Arm of Dawn were dubbed, well, the first men. Some maesters believe that, quote, the first men originated in the grasslands now known as the Dothraki Sea, before beginning a long westward migration that took them across the Arm of Dawn to Westeros. This migration is thought to have occurred somewhere between eight and 12,000 years ago, and so there's little information about this era. We cannot, for example, speculate with any degree of certainty why the first men left mainland Essos. Were they a successful group looking for more resources? Were they victimized by another more powerful group and so up sticks and fled? Were they persecuted for their religion, afraid of being taken into slavery, or did they have a moment of prophecy that guided them west as the Targaryens had thousands of years later? Whatever the case, they didn't just dribble across the Arm of Dawn one by one, but came to settle in great numbers, indicating a significant migration. Whereas the children had only had to contend with giants thus far, who despite their physical threat were not going to outsmart them, the first men came armed with bronze weapons and the ability to sculpt the land around them. The influx of first men must have sent shockwaves through the children's forest as their green seers watched the situation unfold through their weirwood network. This is where the parallels with the two a day we covered in the first segment come to the fore, a species of supernatural native folk attempting in vain to ward off waves of human invaders. And the first men apparently had a leader coordinating this invasion. In A Dance with Dragons, we see Reek in Barriton in the north. He stares up at, quote, the grassy slopes of the Great Barrow. Some claimed it was the grave of the first king who had led the first men to Westeros. Others argued that it must be some king of the giants who was buried there to account for its size. While the grave really belonging to the first king seems like a bit of a stretch, considering it would have taken generations for the invaders to spread that far north, perhaps the main takeaway is the supposed existence of a first king full stop. And the World Book adds a couple of other regional associations with the first king, beginning with House Dustin. It says... The rusted crown upon the arms of House Dustin derives from their claim that they are themselves descended from the first king and the Barrow kings who ruled after him. Not to be outdone, the Reach stakes its own claim to this legendary figure, speculating that he was their mythical forebear, Garth Greenhands. Yandel says, 
Garth Greenhands was the High King of the First Men, it is written. It is he who led them out of the east and across the land bridge to Westeros. Yet other tales would have us believe that he preceded the arrival of the First Men by thousands of years, making him not only the first man in Westeros, but the only man, wandering the length and breadth of the land alone, and treating with the giants and the children of the forest. Some even say he was a god. And so, as the first king, if there ever was such a figure, made inroads into Westeros through Dorne and then ever northwards, what we need to consider is how different the environment was during that era. In the current timeline, the areas north of Dorne contain huge swaths of grassy, farmable land. But it seems that before the arrival of the First Men, the landscapes were dominated by forest. Yeah, in the Stormlands section of the World Book, we're told that the children made their homes in the vast primeval forest that once stretched from Cape Roth to Cape Kraken, north of the Iron Islands. Today, all that remains of this great wood are the Kingswood and the Rainwood. And so, looking at the map, the area between Cape Roth and Cape Kraken is massive, meaning there were forests everywhere. That might be why, as the first men began to stream into the continent, the children envisaged a peaceful coexistence. Yandel says, It is written that in the beginning the children of the forest welcomed the newcomers to Westeros, in the belief that there was land enough for all. However, this generous hospitality must have dissipated when men started to farm in order to create fields that could yield crops and house cattle to feed their ever-growing number of hungry mouths. The first men needed to cut down trees. Suddenly, the spread of humanity directly correlated to the loss of the children's habitat, no doubt raising tensions between the two groups and sinking the optimistic yet naive notion of a thriving coexistence. And to make matters worse, the first men began felling the ancient weirwoods that the children held sacred. Whether the first men did this initially because they were flattening the land, or whether they felt threatened by the spying eyes, is difficult to say, but those options are not mutually exclusive. Either way, the children must have viewed this desecration as sacrilege offensive enough to go to war over. And when it came to conflict between the two species, the first men definitely had specific reason to fell weirwoods, and they began to explicitly target the magical trees. Yandel says, It was their fear of the weirwoods spying upon them that drove them to cut down many of the carved trees and weirwood groves, to deny the children such an advantage. So, the more weirwoods the first men chopped down, the more hostile the children became, and the more hostile the children became, the more weirwoods were felled, and this vicious cycle perpetuated open war between the two species. The years turned to decades and then centuries, and the first men and children remained in conflict. As time went on, it was the men who found themselves on an aggressive front footing. Yandel says, They came in ever-increasing numbers, claiming the stormlands and the reach and the riverlands for their own, eventually reaching even the Vale in the north. They drove the elder races before them, slaughtering giants wherever they found them, hewing down weirwood trees with their bronze axes, making bloody war against the children of the forest. The children fought back as best they could, but the first men were larger and stronger, riding their horses Clad and armed in bronze, the first men overwhelmed the elder race wherever they met, for the weapons of the children were made of bone and wood and dragonglass. And so, even with their magical advantages, the children found themselves hard-pressed against an aggressively expansionist enemy. Over generations, territory was ceded, and the children must have realised they were only going to become weaker and their foe stronger. They must have felt desperate to defend themselves, seize the affronts to their religion and culture, and preserve their way of life for future generations. If only there was a way to stem the tide of invaders. The smashing of the Arm of Dorne is dubbed the single most important event in Dornish history, and mayhaps the history of all Westeros in the world book. 
While Yanda laments that there's a frustratingly small amount of information available on this cataclysm, the apparent explanation couldn't be more pertinent to today's discussion. It says, Finally, driven by desperation, the little people turned to sorcery and beseeched their green seers to stem the tide of these invaders. And so they did, gathering in their hundreds, some say on the Isle of Faces, and calling on their old gods with song and prayer and grisly sacrifice. A thousand captive men were fed to the weirwood, one version of the tale goes, whilst another claims the children used the blood of their own young. And the old gods stirred, and giants awoke in the earth, and all of Westeros shook and trembled. Great cracks appeared in the earth, and hills and mountains collapsed and were swallowed up. And then the seas came rushing in, and the arm of Dorne was broken and shattered by the force of the water until only a few bare rocky islands remained above the waves. The summer sea joined the narrow sea, and the bridge between Essos and Westeros vanished for all time. If the tale of the children of the forest calling down the hammer of the waters is true, and we'd have to wonder why George would include these details if it wasn't, this legend serves to demonstrate the mind-boggling force of the dark magic the green seers were able to wield. Given magic is often related to a cost of sacrifice in this saga, it's perhaps no wonder that there's mention of the Greenseers killing a thousand first men or donating the blood of their own offspring. It adds a folk horror twist to the cataclysm and underscores exactly how desperate the children were to defend their territory. They essentially called in an earthquake to reshape the land itself. And we're also told that there was a similar occurrence in the north. Whether this was part of the same event that shattered the Arm of Dorne or a disparate hammer of the waters remains unclear, but it should be noted that while the Dornish Cataclysm was said to have been called down from the Isle of Faces, the northern one is noted to have been conducted from the northern edge of the Neck. Yeah, in Catelyn's eighth chapter of A Game of Thrones, she passes through Moat Caelin and sees the tall, slender children's tower, where legend said the children of the forest had once called upon their nameless gods to send the hammer of the waters. And then, in Theon IV of A Clash of Kings, Maester Lewin adds, The histories say the Cranagman grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the hammer of the waters down upon the neck. So it seems that the children of the forest used dark magic to create earthquakes that not only successfully smashed the landline from Essos to Westeros, but attempted to split the continent in two at the neck, no doubt hoping to create two distinct landmasses. Yeah, in the case of Dorne, they stemmed the tide of invaders passing from continent to continent, given the first men were noted not to be seafarers. But in the case of the Neck, it seems likely the green seers desired to keep the northern landmass to themselves while ceding everything south of the Neck to the first men. However, this time the cataclysm failed and the Neck was not entirely split. Instead, the area was swamped and became a vast expanse of boggy marshland, which actually suited the children well enough because it provided a natural and often impenetrable defense against invaders. And it was during this time that certain tribes of first men apparently grew close to the children. The Cranagmen, as they're now called, grew so close, in fact, that legend has it they intermarried with them, explaining why the modern Cranagmen are typically small in stature. The Cranagmen were led by their Marsh King until, quote, The last Marsh King was killed by Lord Rickard Stark, who took his daughter to wife, whereupon the Cranagmen bent their knees and accepted the dominion of Winterfell. So here arises the possibility of magical bloodlines in George's world, but we'll save a detailed discussion of that for later and keep on track here with our discussion of the war against the First Men. Yeah, we can imagine after the double hammer of the waters that the First Men might have lost some of their appetite for war. With the children retreating and turning to dark magic, they must have realized that their chances of winning decisively were diminishing. So both sides agreed to make peace in an event known to history as the Pact. 
Here's what Gandil tells us. The wisest of both races prevailed, and the chief heroes and rulers of both sides met upon the isle in the god's eye to form the pact. Giving up all the lands of Westeros save for the deep forests, the children won from the first men the promise that they would no longer cut down the weirwoods. All the weirwoods on the isle on which the pact was forged were then carved with faces so that the gods could witness the pact, and the order of green men was made afterward to tend to the weirwoods and protect the isle. So the pact was made roughly 10,000 years ago. Given that we're told the first men arrived 12,000 years ago, as rough as these dates may be, we get a sense of just how long the two species were at war, centuries if not millennia, possibly as much as 2,000 years. It's no wonder that war weariness set in on both sides. Westeros was in dire need of peace. And the children weren't exactly asking for a lot. Having surrendered so much land to the first men over the generations of war, in peace they didn't seek to regain territory, but instead, much like real-world Anglo-Saxons negotiating with pagan Northmen to save their churches and monasteries, the children seemed mainly motivated by the desire to protect their weirwood trees. This serves to illustrate just how important the trees were to the children as a central aspect of their culture and religion. So the first men took the promise of being able to peacefully settle in any open land and agreed to leave the sacred weirwoods alone. The pact was agreed on the Isle of Faces, and new faces carved onto the weirwoods there actually gave the isle its name. One of the most interesting aspects about the pact is the mention of the Order of the Green Men. Who or what the Green Men are is one of the deeper mysteries of the series, and they are so seldom mentioned readers can be forgiven for forgetting about them. However, one person who hasn't forgotten about them is George R. R. Martin. When asked by a fan all the way back in 1999, will we see or hear anything of the Green Men on the Isle of Faces, George replied, The Green Men and the Isle of Faces will come to the fore in later books. And as if to emphasise their significance, he added, Boy, it's tough to sneak anything by you guys. So, despite only being mentioned occasionally, it seems like the Green Men are not just an element of world building, but an important part of the future story. So let's take a look at what we know about them to see if we can get a grasp on what their role in the story might be. The Green Men are actually mentioned very early on in the saga. In Kat's first Game of Thrones chapter, set in the Winterfell Godswood, she thinks, In the South, the last weirwoods had been cut down or burned out a thousand years ago, except on the Isle of Faces, where the Green Men kept their silent watch. Paired with Maester Lewin's comment later in the same book that the sacred order of green men was formed to keep watch over the Isle of Faces, we can conclude that the green men are protectors of the Isle, perhaps originally seeking to ensure the pact was upheld by protecting its everlasting witnesses, like priests tending an eternal flame. When recounting the Night of the Laughing Tree tale to Bran, Mira Reed implies that her father, Howland, visited the Isle of Faces and met the Green Men. From Old Nan, we get the information that they ride elks and sometimes have horns, and Yandel tells us that the Count's describing them as horned with dark green skin is a corruption of the likely truth, which is that the green men wore green garments and horned headdresses. There is very little further information on the green men, and so their order is surrounded with mystery. With their position on the Isle of Faces in the God's Eye, which being close to Harrenhal in the Riverlands is hardly a remote spot, We have to wonder how they've existed for the last 10,000 years. There are no reports of them ever leaving the Isle, so it seems they've been permanently confined. How does this mysterious race find food? How do they procreate across generations when there are apparently so few of them? What do they spend their time doing? Perhaps the notion of little green men is a misdirection. Given that the pact was overseen by green seers, we wonder if it isn't possible that the order of the green men are in fact a band of green seers caught up in a weirwood network grown into the trees. 
as we'll see, they could then take nourishment from the weirwoods, wouldn't have to breed, and could spend their time on the weirnet, perhaps trying to influence fate where they can. We're told weirwoods never die if left untouched, so is it possible that the green men on the Isle of Faces are actually one and the same green seers who oversaw the pact 10,000 years ago, rather than their mysterious descendants? We'll get back to this notion later in the episode, but in truth, we simply have too few details to conclude with any confidence who or what the Green Men are, or what will be their overall purpose to the wider plot when they finally come to the fore, but it is fun to speculate. What seems certain is the fact that the signing of the pact on the Isle of Faces heralded a new era of peace between the First Men and the children, an era that would become known as the Age of Heroes. The pact began 4,000 years of friendship between men and children. In time, the first men even put aside the gods they had brought with them and took up the worship of the secret gods of the wood. The signing of the pact ended the Dawn Age and began the Age of Heroes. According to Maester Lewin, the Pact and the Age of Heroes began 4,000 years of friendship between men and children. Even accounting for historical inaccuracies, the message is that there was a very long period of peace, stability, and coexistence in Westeros. To demonstrate just how at ease with each other some of the men and children became during that era, Lewin adds that, In time, the first men even put aside the gods they had brought with them and took up the worship of the secret gods of the wood. So this seems like an elegant solution to the first men chopping down weirwoods left, right and centre. They began to embrace the worship of the old gods. Of course, by then, it's likely that men had skin changers and green seers in their own ranks, and so their connection to the religion would have been greatly increased due to those benefits being no longer confined to the children. It must have been a powerful and convincing demonstration of the old gods when humans began dreaming of the future and inhabiting animals as the children had done for millennia. And so the first men became converts with so much conviction that we witnessed Ned Stark solemnly praying to the gods of the Weirwood in the Winterfell Godswood thousands of years later. Although the peace in Westeros was by all accounts long-lasting, nothing lasts forever. The arrival of a new species on the continent named the Others began a period of darkness known to history as the Long Night. And we covered the Long Night in great detail in our recent Others episode, but for now we'll reiterate the basics with the emphasis on the children. According to Old Nan, the Icy Others swept down from the far north to begin a terrible campaign of slaughter that saw them raising the dead to bolster their own army. Men struggled to stand against them due to the incessant cold and darkness that accompanied them, not to mention the giant ice spiders, but there was one beleaguered legendary figure who apparently turned the tide of war. Yeah, Old Nan tells Bran, the last hero determined to seek out the children in the hopes that their ancient magics could win back what the armies of men had lost. He set out into the Deadlands with a sword, a horse, a dog, and a dozen companions. For years he searched, until he despaired of ever finding the children of the forest in their secret cities. One by one his friends died, and his horse, and finally even his dog, and his sword froze so hard the blade snapped when he tried to use it and the others smelled the hot blood in him, and came silent on his trail, stalking him with packs of white spiders, big as hounds. George uses Maester Lewin's interruption there to withhold further information and keep us on the edge of our seats. However, although we don't get a detailed account of what comes next in the story, there are overt hints in the main plot points. First of all, when meeting Yorin of the Night's Watch later in A Game of Thrones and hearing about his Uncle Benjen's disappearance, Bran suddenly recalls what happened with the last hero. It says, 
All Bran could think of was Old Nan's story of the others and the last hero hounded through the white woods by dead men and spiders big as hounds. He was afraid for a moment until he remembered how that story ended. The children will help him, he blurted, the children of the forest. Then in a feast for crows, Samuel Tarley, having researched the long night in the Castle Black Library, tells Jon Snow that... I found one account of the long knight that spoke of the last hero slaying others with a blade of dragon steel. Supposedly, they could not stand against it. And so, reading between the lines, we think it's likely that the help the children provided the last hero was to outline the other's weaknesses. Given that we know the children hunted with dragonglass, when we see Samwell slay another with a dragonglass blade, we can join the dots and assume that the children taught the last hero of the other's vulnerability to obsidian. Although whether dragon steel contains dragonglass might be open for debate, we know for sure that the children were supplying the Night's Watch with dragonglass daggers during the Age of Heroes. And with the children, the last hero, and the first iteration of the Night's Watch all working together, the War for the Dawn was won and the others defeated. But one of the questions remaining was, who were the others and where did they come from? Again, we went into more detail on this in our Others episode, but to summarize, we discussed whether the children might have played a role in creating the Others. After all, the others had descended from the far north, where we know the children had retreated, and it therefore seems like a strange coincidence that the others' vulnerability matches the children's weapon of choice. Given that the world book hints to a tribe of first men settling in the far north being the others, and that the children are capable of colossal dark magic, it's possible that there was some magical meddling from the children of the forest— Could the others, with their human characteristics and ability to control the dead, be a tribe of corrupted human skin changers magically engineered by the children? The problem with this idea, though, is that there is no mention of the first men breaking the pact, and so the children lack a motive to unleash massive carnage against them. It's true they had given up a lot of land and might have held resentment, but George does go to some effort to describe a long harmonious period. An idea we had here is that the children's green seers could have glimpsed the future and seen the Andals burning down weirwoods, assumed it was the first men, and preemptively created the others. Misinterpreted prophecy is a huge theme in this story and we doubt the children were infallible to such errors of interpretation, given that glimpses of the future are delivered symbolically and cryptically. It would be fitting to George's style if the others were created because of such a mistake. Another idea is that a breakaway group of children created the others to reap revenge on humans. Although it's clear the children aided man during the long night, The world book tells us that they lived in clans, so who's to say there wasn't a clan of disaffected children who were unhappy with man's dominance of Westeros? Just as there is a multiplicity of worldviews in human characters, it seems likely that there's a moral diversity amongst the children and that they don't all have the same personality or ethos. And with the others finally vanquished, retreating to the lands of always winter, Westeros was destined to forever be a place of peace, right? Well, not exactly, because over in Essos, a race of men known as the Andals had their sights set on a mass western migration. In-universe, historians disagree on the timing of the Andal invasion, with estimates ranging from 2,000 to 6,000 years ago. Given that the Long Night is said to have occurred six to 8,000 years ago, it's anyone's guess how closely the coming of the Andals followed. But follow it did. Hailing from Andalos in mainland Essos, the Andals were a race of fair-haired men carrying iron and steel instead of bronze and worshipping the faith of the Seven. Their religion suggests that a legendary Andal figure named Hugor of the Hill was promised a great kingdom on foreign soil by the Seven themselves, influencing their epic decision to emigrate. 
However, that might not have been the only factor, given that the Valyrian Empire may well have been at its peak during this era, marking the Andals as potential victims for dragon-led subjugation and slavery. While the Andals might have been seen as easy targets within Essos, in Westeros they were a force to be reckoned with. Perhaps the peace between the First Men and the Children had left both groups militarily unfocused. Perhaps the Long Night had left Westeros vulnerable. Or perhaps the Andals made inroads into the continent with such numbers, superior weaponry and levels of aggression that they were able to attack on a front footing. Either way, the result was that the Andals first landed in the Vale, conquered successfully, then moved west through the Riverlands and beyond. And we could talk all day about the Andal invasion, with all its battles and negotiations, but let's instead leave that for another day and keep a tight focus on the children of the forest. While the children had made a mutually beneficial peace pact with the First Men, What must they have thought when they saw thousands of Andals streaming in and slaughtering their allies? Worse, the Andals brought religious intolerance with them, which led to the sacred weirwoods being destroyed by men once again. As Maester Lewin tells Bran, the Andals burnt out the weirwood groves, hacked down the faces, slaughtered the children where they found them, and everywhere proclaimed the triumph of the Seven over the Old Gods. Given the generations the children had been at war with the First Men, and the fact they eventually yielded so much land, we can guess that they were already dwindling in numbers. This fresh wave of attacks, though, must have devastated them and sent them towards the brink of extinction. Of course, we know that some exist to this day, But it seems that, with few exceptions, the Andals essentially managed to eradicate their existence south of the Neck. While much of the slaughter has been lost to history, there is one recorded account of the Andal persecution of the children. Maester Yandel tells us of the Andal invasion that... One Andal, remembered in legend as Eric the Kinslayer, came across the Great Hill of High Heart. There, while under the protection of the kings of the First Men, the children of the forest had tended to the mighty carved weirwoods that crowned it. When Eric's warriors sought to cut down the trees, the First Men are said to have fought beside the children, but the might of the Andals was too great. Though the children and First Men made a valiant effort to defend their holy grove, all were slain. The tale-tellers now claim that the ghosts of the children still haunt the hill by night. To this day... Rivermen shun the place. And in the main series, we get to see High Heart through Arya Stark's POV in A Storm of Swords. There she meets a mysterious yet monumentally important character called the Ghost of High Heart, who we'll discuss later. It's Tom O'Sevens who first introduces the story of the Andal destruction on the sacred grove at High Heart though without the detail of First Men allies included by Yandel. Here's the passage. The small folk hereabouts shun the place, Tom told her. It was said to be haunted by the ghosts of the children of the forest who had died here when the Andal king named Eric the Kinslayer had cut down their grove. One place cherished by the children that seems to have survived the Andal onslaught is the Isle of Faces. With the faces of the old gods carved on every weirwood tree, you would think that the isle would be a prime target for the Andals, and, bearing steel and fire, they would be able to sweep over the place with little resistance. This has led to intriguing in-world speculation that those curious green men we discussed earlier threw a wrench in the Andals' works. As Yandel puts it, It is possible that a few children survived on the Isle of Faces, as some have written, under the protection of the green men whom the Andals never succeeded in destroying. But again, no definitive proof has ever been found. Sadly, in spite of the cooperation between children and first men at places like High Heart and in the Stormlands, where the Weirwood alliance between the first men of House Durandon and the children won several key victories against the Andal invaders, 
The success of this line of resistance seems to have been the exception as the Andal mission to eradicate a species deemed abominations along with their strange gods rolled across southern Westeros. The children were decimated by these new men and this time there would be no negotiations or pacts. The Andals were without mercy for the children and strong enough to drive them from the deep woods of Westeros forevermore, save perhaps the Isle of Faces. With no sign of them in southern Westeros for generations, many characters in story believe them to be extinct. However, those familiar with the fringes of civilization to the far north are not so sure. Yeah, when Maester Lewin told Bran in A Game of Thrones that the children had used blades of obsidian, Asha of the Free Folk corrects his assumption of in the past, saying tersely, and still do. And earlier, when Lewin confidently declared to Bran that the children of the forest have been dead and gone for thousands of years, all that is left of them are the faces in the trees, Yorin of the Night's Watch wasn't so sure. Down here, that might be true, Maester, but up past the wall, who's to say? Up there, a man can't always tell what's alive and what's dead. Little did Bran know at the time that he was destined to discover the truth of Yorin's words. And up next, we'll delve into a further exploration of the mysteries of magical bloodlines, magical trees, and magical abilities, following which we'll take a close look at the children's role in the current story in our final segment. But first, it's time for us to give thanks to our patrons from the Valyrian Steel level. Thanks so much to Aileen, Akiva of House Hunt, Oxheart, Amber the Adamant, Anna, Arshia, Blight Spirit, Archmaester Kobe of the Higher Mysteries, Cabeth the Unfrozen, David, Dean, James K, Lord Sosa and his faithful canine companion Theoden, Jill, Miss Jody, J.M., Herbert Westeros, the Miskatonic Maester, Casey, Lady Silverwing, Infandaris, the Unspeakable Terror, Mark, Boss, Schwartz the Black, Noble Sir Matthew, Sword of the Early Moon, the Sothorian, Sally, Tristis Lurian, Wild Child of the Wolfswood, Tater Nuts, Tim, Magnar of House Ten, W, Sword of the Evening, and Lady Darlis of Castle Naki, the Alpha Patron. The histories say the Cranagmen grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the Greenseers tried to bring the Hammer of the Waters down upon the neck. It may be that they have secret knowledge. While the green magics we've discussed, skin changing, green dreaming, and green seeing, are no doubt derived from the children of the forest and their seemingly natural abilities, we see in the current timeline that these powers have somehow been passed on to certain humans. So now it's time to look at how that might have occurred, as well as taking a closer look at said magics to see what else we can glean. To begin, we need to understand what happened between the children of the forest and humans when they weren't at each other's throats. Given that we know they coexisted in peace for thousands of years, and that the first men eventually adopted their religion and aspects of their culture, there must have been at the very least friendship between the two species. And the place where they seemed to have overlapped the most was in the Cranogs of the North. Yeah, as we mentioned, Maester Lewin informs Theon Greyjoy in A Clash of Kings that, quote, the histories say the Cranach men grew close to the children of the forest in the days when the green seers tried to bring the Hammer of the Waters down upon the neck. So, whatever happened with the Hammer of the Waters, it seems that the transformation of the area into inhospitable terrain dominated by swamps and bogs created an environment where the children could exist with more natural protection than when they were out in the open. The depths of the neck, therefore, were a relative sanctuary away from the aggression of men. However, there were still humans living in that area, a faction of first men referred to as Cranogmen. And as to Maester Lewin's assertion that the Cranogmen and children grew close in this strange and secluded environment, perhaps the question should be, how close? 
The first notable characteristic of the Kranagman is their small size. The World Book gives us two possible reasons for this. One, that, quote, it results from inadequate nourishment, for grains do not flourish amidst the fens and swamps and salt marshes of the neck, and the Kranagman subsists largely upon a diet of fish, frogs, and lizards. However, while this seems like a fair and logical conclusion, it's the second explanation that intrigues us most. It says, Some say they are small in stature because they intermarried with the children of the forest. And although Maester Yandel is unsurprisingly skeptical about this possibility, the notion of intermarriage between the two species makes a lot of sense. First, there's the wording that George employs with Lewin's comments. Within this possible context, growing close in the swamps of the neck seems like a loaded phrase, alongside the small size of the Kranigman, which could be interpreted as a characteristic gained from the small children. There's the foundation for a strong case for such mingling to be made. Added to that is the reputation of the Kranigman among the human characters. Big Walder Frey insists in A Clash of Kings that frog eaters don't smell like men. They have a boggy stink like frogs and trees and scummy water. Moss grows under their arms in place of hair, and they can live with nothing to eat but mud and breathe swamp water. While there is plenty of childish hyperbole from Big Walder here, there might be some truth in the notion that the Cranach men are somehow different. And then, of the two Cranach folk we've actually met, one of them is a young yet wise green dreamer who seems to be quite educated on magics that were once exclusive to the children. Jojen Reed instructs Bran Stark, acting like a mini-mentor, preparing him for some grand destiny as a green seer. Regarding the source of Jojen's abilities, he claims that the dreams were woken in him by a three-eyed crow as a child after a serious illness, which parallels Bran's experience after his fall. But Jojen is also noted to be somewhat frail and to have very green eyes, in light of which it's worth noting what Bloodraven tells Bran about the green seers of the children. Once in a great while one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood or green as the moss on a tree in the heart of the forest. By these signs do the gods mark those they have chosen to receive the gift. The chosen ones are not robust, and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. Could Jojen's physical characteristics hint that something he inherited in his blood gave him the ability to green dream? And speaking of blood... Along those lines, when Bran arrives at the cave north of the Wall to begin his true apprenticeship with Bloodraven, his new mentor tells him, your blood makes you a green seer. So there it is. We're ultimately told in no uncertain terms that the green magics are a matter of blood. In our previous episodes on dragons and others, we've speculated on whether or not George employs the well-worn fantasy trope of magical bloodlines in this story. We think the fact that some characters with first men blood possess these green magics adds to a compelling case that yes, he does. So now let's return to what Maester Yandel says about the relationship between Cranagman and Starks. Long ago, the histories claim the Cranagmen were ruled by the Marsh Kings. Singers tell of them riding on lizard lions and using great frog spears like lances, but that is clearly fancy. Were these Marsh Kings even truly kings as we understand it? Archmaester Eron writes that the Cranagmen saw their kings as the first among equals, who were often thought to be touched by the old gods, a fact that was said to show itself in eyes of strange hues, or even in speaking with animals as the children are said to have done. Whatever the truth, the last man to be called Marsh King was killed by King Rickard Stark, sometimes called the Laughing Wolf in the North, for his good nature, who took the man's daughter to wife, whereupon the Cranagmen bent their knees and accepted the dominion of Winterfell. In the centuries since, the Cranagmen have become stout allies of the Starks under the leadership of the Reeds of Greywater Watch. 
So again, there's that hint about eye color and magical abilities. And the story of the marriage of the Marsh King's daughter to the Laughing Wolf might be a major clue about how the Starks ended up with a dose of magical children's blood, as we hear of King Rickard Stark marrying the daughter of a Marsh King. Of course, there were no doubt many marriages between Cranigmen and other northern firstmen over the generations, but here George is serving us a possible through line from children to Cranigmen to Stark, and in a passage that explicitly mentions their magical characteristics that mirror those of the children to boot. If it really is true that the children of the forest and Cranigmen were able to breed and pass on a magical blood that gifted the Stark children skin-changing and, in Brand's case, green-seeing abilities, it shows how thoroughly George likes to weave aspects of ancient history and world-building to affect the current story. And so we can see that these green abilities seem to be present in characters of First Men descent. In the current story, we have the Stark children all confirmed to be skin changers to some degree by George himself, and there are six wildling characters with those abilities too, Aurel and his eagle, Briar and her shadow cat, Rizella and her goat, Barok and his boar, Hagen and his wolf, and Hagen's pupil Varamir, known as Sixskins due to his control of a snow bear, three wolves, and a shadow cat, and ultimately Orel's eagle. Given Bran's Stark blood, Jojen Reed's Cranogman blood, and Blood Raven's Blackwood mother, we can see the heavy association of the green magics in humans and first men blood. And perhaps one thing missing from this theory is a hybrid character who displays physical characteristics of both children and humans. Well, there is actually a decent case to be made that we've seen one such in the story already. The ghost of High Heart has a love of, well, High Heart, sacred territory to the old children of the forest. She's described as not just small like Cranachman, but tiny, a foot shorter than 10-year-old Arya. Like Brynden Rivers, she has milk-white skin and red eyes, the coloring of a weirwood, and she claims to hear the whisperings of the old gods, explaining her prophetic visions that, while largely symbolic, seem to come true with unerring accuracy. Certainly, there's a strong connection between her and the old gods. But while her links to the children of the forest seem straightforward enough, she can't be one of them because there's no mention of the large ears or claw hands. And so there is a possibility that the ghost of High Heart could be a hybrid of the two species, a mix of child and human. While we don't know enough about her background to make any firm conclusions here, this theory does offer an explanation for one of the most unusual characters in the series. We'll leave it there for the ghost of High Heart for the moment, but we'll return to her later when we evaluate the huge impact she might have had on Westeros. So, along with the notion that green powers can be passed along through blood and breeding, one thing we should point out is that blood is certainly no guarantee of these special powers. Although we've listed the characters in the current story that we know to be skin changers, green dreamers, or green seers, out of all the many characters with a decent amount of first men blood, this is still a tiny percentage. Yeah, when Blood Raven is schooling Bran about green powers, he says, Only one man in a thousand is born a skin changer, and only one skin changer in a thousand can be a green seer. While these are surely rough guesstimate odds, we do get a sense of how occasional skin changes are and how incredibly rare potential green seers are. Blood Raven and Bran have each beaten million to one odds, it seems. Yet there might be a takeaway even more improbable. As we said, George has confirmed each of the six Stark kids are wargs. So that's six children at a thousand to one shots, all in the same family. This fact is so unlikely it causes the reader to consider if there's something extra special about the Stark kids. Could the old gods, Blood Raven, the Green Men, or some other divine force have influenced this apparent anomaly? With the others rising from their millennia-long slumber, dragons brought back from extinction, and the talk of an ancient hero being reborn— this is a crucial moment in history, and so it seems a heck of a coincidence that the Stark kids are all born with their magic in the same generation. 
Yes, yeah, six wargs is an impressive stat for House Stark. But perhaps most important of all in terms of green powers is Bran. Not only is he a strong skin changer, but his whole story revolves around his journey to become a green seer. To continue to shed light on that journey, up next, let's take a closer look at the relationship between the green seers, the old gods, and the weirwoods. Time is different for a tree than for a man. Sun and soil and water, these are things a weirwood understands, not days and years and centuries. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. The lives of trees are different. They root and grow and die in one place, and that river does not move them. The oak is the acorn, the acorn is the oak, and the weirwood. A thousand human years are a moment to a weirwood, and through such gates you and I may gaze into the past. Not content with a world inhabited by iconic characters and species, George found room in his story for iconic trees. The weirwood trees of A Song of Ice and Fire are as important and recognizable as the dragons, the others, or the children of the forest. They are magical, central to the worship of the old gods, and carry important historical information that George would struggle to convey otherwise. In his initial setup, George chooses the second proper chapter of A Game of Thrones to give them a detailed introduction when Catelyn finds Ned in the Winterfell Godswood, in a contemplative mood after beheading a Night's Watch deserter. We get this early description of the heart tree there. At the centre of the grove, an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. The weirwood's bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red like a thousand blood-stained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk of the great tree, its features long and melancholy, the deep-cut eyes red with dried sap and strangely watchful. They were old, those eyes, older than Winterfell itself. They had seen Brandon the Builder set the first stone, if the tales were true. They had watched the castle's granite walls rise around them. It was said that the children of the forest had carved the faces in the trees during the dawn centuries before the coming of the first men across the narrow sea. So, with the leaves described like hands and bark like bone and faces carved into their trunks, we can see that from the outset George is personifying the weirwood trees, giving them human characteristics at every opportunity. And in fact, when we look at the name weirwood, it breaks down to weir plus wood. And given the phonetic similarity between weir, that is W-E-I-R, and the prefix were, W-E-R-E, which is an archaic term meaning male human, as we've seen used in words like werewolf, meaning man-wolf, we can probably surmise that weirwood is meant to mean man-wood or man-tree. And in Bran's second chapter of A Game of Thrones, we get another early reference to the anthropomorphic qualities of the weirwoods when he thinks the heart tree had always frightened him. Trees ought not have eyes, Bran thought, or leaves that looked like hands. There is something very human about these trees, and from the very beginning, we sense there are mysteries and secrets about them. And in spite of the aforementioned widespread weirwood devastation at the hands of the First Men and later the Andals, there's still a decent amount of them scattered across the map. While it's sad that many of the wonderful trees have been burned or cut down, George has placed a good number strategically to witness key events. And while we won't make an exhaustive list here, let's look at some interesting examples. In the north, we've seen weirwoods at Winterfell, Molestown, the Night Fort, White Harbour, Deepwood Mott, and near the Crofters' village Stannish shelters at in the build-up to the Battle of Ice that will kick off the Winds of Winter. Though given the widespread worship of the Old Gods, perhaps we can surmise there are many more that we have yet to see on page. 
Then beyond the wall, there's the grove where Jon Snow and Sam set their Night's Watch vows, and there are weirwoods at White Tree, the Skirling Pass, the village we see in the Varamyr prologue, and over Blood Raven's cave. Then down south, where white trees were terribly vulnerable to the Andal onslaught, there are still weirwoods growing at Harrenhal, the Isle of Faces, River Run, Casterly Rock, High Garden, which has three, the Isle of Ravens at the Citadel in Old Town, and one sapling at the Whispers on Crackclaw Point, where Nimble Dick Crab is buried. Additionally, Storm's End had a weirwood tree in its godswood until Stannis burned it in honor of his conversion to the worship of the red god Relore in A Clash of Kings. And so, even aside from the old weirwood stumps found in places like High Heart, or the enormous dead tree at Raven Tree Hall, the seat of House Blackwood, that is said to have been poisoned by House Bracken, there are weirwoods in some key places that allow for interesting story opportunities should a green seer choose to look through the trees in the present. For example, Bran could witness the Battle of Ice, where it seems Stannis has set a trap on the icy lake beside the Crofter's village for the approaching Frey and Bolton forces to fall through. We already have Asha and Theon there to be our close POVs, but George could also give us a weirwood viewpoint from the cave in the north. And so we see the potential going forward of an extra camera at any of the aforementioned Weirwood locations, which we think is an ingenious device to experience events in a different way. It's very exciting to consider what and who Bran will be watching in The Winds of Winter. And that's even before we consider the historical and perhaps even future events he might be privy to from his Weirwood throne. One point to note from our list of living weirwoods is that most grow in God's woods. It makes sense that with so many wild trees having been cut down, those best protected were the ones within walls on castle grounds. These weirwoods were planted for worship in groves known as God's woods, or are maintained as peaceful areas of solitude and reflection for those houses no longer adhering to the old gods. And the center point of any God's wood is a heart tree. Yeah, heart trees are those with carved faces revered by old god worshippers. In A Game of Thrones, Catelyn thinks about her adopted home in the north. Here, every castle had its godswood, and every godswood had its heart tree, and every heart tree its face. But it's worth noting that while the majority of heart trees are weirwoods, they are not synonymous, because when a weirwood is not available, other trees can be used. When Ned is in King's Landing and prays in the Red Keep Godswood, we get this. The heart tree there was a great oak, its ancient limbs overgrown with smokeberry vines. They knelt before it to offer their thanksgiving, as if it had been a weirwood. Similarly, at the Godswood in Darry, the heart tree is described as having black branches, which might indicate the tree isn't a weirwood, although that could be inconclusive, as it's only mentioned briefly. The fact that some heart trees aren't weirwoods does beg the question as to whether a green seer can see through their eyes, but given how sacred and revered weirwoods are to the children of the forest, we think it's a good bet that only they allow for the green seeing magic. Perhaps non weirwood heart trees offer comfort to those old god worshippers on a symbolic level without the memory and magic of a weirwood. Which brings us to the question of what the old gods actually are. In 1998, George wrote that the old gods of the first men and the children of the forest are nameless and numerous, a sentiment echoed by Jon Snow when he thinks the Starks worship the old gods, the nameless gods, and if the heart trees heard, they did not speak. And by Maester Yandel when he writes... The gods the children worshipped were the nameless ones that would one day become the gods of the first men, the innumerable gods of the streams and forest and stones. And Varamir of the free folk seems to agree with this animistic view of the old gods, believing of his dead brother that the gods have taken him down into the earth, into the trees. The gods are all around us, in the rocks and streams, in the birds and beasts. 
Yet the old gods being everywhere might allude to something more than traditional animism, because we learn that the children of the forest actually equate weirwoods to the old gods. Here's what Bloodraven tells Bran in A Dance with Dragons. The singers of the forest had no books, no ink, no parchment, no written language. Instead, they had the trees and the weirwoods above all. When they died, they went into the wood, into leaf and limb and root, and the trees remembered. All their songs and spells, their histories and prayers, everything they knew about this world. Maesters will tell you that the weirwoods are sacred to the old gods. The singers believe they are the old gods. And so, if skin changers can see through the eyes of animals, and green seers can see through weirwoods, and as Bloodraven mentions, even beyond the trees... That means there could be someone watching everything you do. Just as some Christians believe God is an all-seeing deity, in George's world, greenseers could potentially hold the same power. So, if the children are going to equate weirwoods to God, then it follows that those with access to the weirwoods' powers become part of that godhood. In a sense, Greenseers become the old god's eyes as they master the weirnet. They are essentially tapping into a divine force. Yeah, and the children also believe that when they die, quote, they become part of that godhood. This is what terrifies Varamir and racks him with guilt for using his warging abilities to kill his younger brother Bump that he was jealous of. He thinks, Bump sees, he is watching me, he knows. Lump could not hide from him, could not slip behind his mother's skirts or run off with the dogs to escape his father's fury. So in the Old God's religion, we can see how weirwoods are vitally important, both spiritually and practically. Having these organic recording machines growing all over Westeros, the children of the forest no doubt felt that their gods were always with them, and that their good deeds were being witnessed and their ill deeds being judged, putting a lot of emphasis on truthfulness and doing the right thing. At the same time, with no other means of recording information such as writing, the trees could capture important aspects of their culture, and later greenseers would have access to these recordings. Nothing useful would ever be forgotten. If you wanted to document your mum's special spaghetti bolognese recipe, you just make it in view of a weirwood. Or maybe if you needed to recall the method used for the Hammer of the Waters, just check the Weirwood tapes from 10,000 years ago. Of course, Bloodraven implies that everything the children know and experience goes into the trees when they die. But in terms of revealing important events to the reader, from source making to destructive magic, this device of being able to see through the trees is invaluable. And so, weirwoods, and by extension greenseers, became an integral part of the children's culture and way of life. The initial waves of first men might have feared the weirwoods gave the children a military advantage, and they might have been right, but the trees offered much more than that. Chopping down those groves was essentially a desecration of the children's identity. It's no wonder that the most important demand the children negotiated for during the pact was the preservation of the trees. And now we've discussed the links between the old gods, weirwoods, and greenseers, and seen the overlap between them, we should consider that caught up in the middle of this Venn diagram is Bran Stark. While we'll save a deep character analysis for another time, hopefully a series we'll get to one day in the not-so-distant future, it would be pertinent to today's episode to consider what else we learn about greenseeing through his POV in A Dance with Dragons. He is, after all, the student of a green seer, with George taking every opportunity in his chapters to provide further exposition to green magic. Since Bran's coma dream, all the way back in A Game of Thrones, the three-eyed crow has been beckoning him towards his secret cave hideout north of the Wall. When Bran first meets the crow, revealed to be none other than missing Night's Watchman Brynden Rivers, a.k.a. Bloodraven, in a cave full of weirwood roots, we get this description. His body was so skeletal and his clothes so rotted that at first Bran took him for another corpse, a dead man propped up so long that the roots had grown over him, under him, and through him. 
What skin the corpse lord showed was white, save for a bloody blotch that crept up his neck onto his cheek. His white hair was fine and thin as root hair and long enough to brush against the earthen floor. Roots coiled around his legs like wooden serpents, one burrowed through his breeches into the desiccated flesh of his thigh to emerge again from his shoulder. A spray of dark red leaves sprouted from his skull, and gray mushrooms spotted his brow. A little skin remained, stretched across his face, tight and hard as white leather, but even that was fraying, and here and there the brown and yellow bone beneath was poking through. Given that Bloodraven was born in 175 AC, 125 years before the start of the story, it's safe to conclude that this weirwood entanglement has lengthened his lifespan, providing him with enough sustenance to live on, physically part of the weirnet. Given the fact that a healthy weirwood left alone never dies, it begs the question about whether greenseers could achieve a form of immortality as well as omniscience, as we mentioned when discussing the green men on the Isle of Faces. And when Bran asks Bloodraven if the greenseers are the equivalent of wizards to the children of the forest, his mentor replies, in a sense... Those you call the children of the forest have eyes as golden as the sun, but once in a great while one is born amongst them with eyes as red as blood or green as the moss on a tree in the heart of the forest. By these signs do the gods mark those they have chosen to receive the gift. The chosen ones are not robust, and their quick years upon the earth are few, for every song must have its balance. But once inside the wood, they linger long indeed. A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. Green seers. And so Bloodraven begins to teach Bran the ways of the green seer. To accelerate the journey, Bran is put on a curious diet of weirwood paste. Here's the passage. It is time, Lord Brynden said. Something in his voice sent icy fingers running up Bran's back. Time for what? For the next step. For you to go beyond skin changing and learn what it means to be a green seer. The trees will teach him, said Leaf. She beckoned, and another of the singers padded forward, the white-haired one that Mira had named Snowy Locks. She had a weirwood bowl in her hands, carved with a dozen faces, like the ones the heart trees wore. Inside was a white paste, thick and heavy, with dark red veins running through it. You must eat of this, said Leaf. She handed Bran a wooden spoon. The boy looked at the bowl uncertainly. What is it? A paste of weirwood seeds. Something about the look of it made Bran feel ill. The red veins were only weirwood sap, he supposed, but in the torchlight they looked remarkably like blood. He dipped the spoon into the paste, then hesitated. Will this make me a greenseer? Your blood makes you a greenseer, said Lord Brynden. This will help awaken your gifts and wed you to the trees. Bran did not want to be married to a tree, but who else would wed a broken boy like him? A thousand eyes, a hundred skins, wisdom deep as the roots of ancient trees. A green seer. He ate it. It had a bitter taste, though not so bitter as acorn paste. The first spoonful was the hardest to get down. He almost retched it right back up. The second tasted better. The third was almost sweet. The rest he spooned up eagerly. Why had he thought that it was bitter? It tasted of honey, of new-fallen snow, of pepper and cinnamon, and the last kiss his mother ever gave him. The empty bowl slipped from his fingers and clattered on the cavern floor. I don't feel any different. What happens next? Leaf touched his hands. The trees will teach you. The trees remember. He raised a hand, and the other singers began to move about the cavern, extinguishing the torches one by one. The darkness thickened and crept towards them. And with the strange description of the veins within the white weirwood paste looking like blood, 
Some fans wonder if this paste might actually contain some of Jojen Reed's actual blood. With Jojen becoming increasingly weak and distant at the latter end of the journey, these theorists wonder if a secret dose of Green Dreamer's blood is just what Bran needs to encourage his abilities in this gruesome theory known in the fandom as Jojen Paste. However, this isn't the first time Weirwood Sap has been described as blood-like. We're told several times that the Weirwood's carved eyes leak sap looking like red tears. At the Crofter's village in the north, Asha Greyjoy looks at the Weirwood and thinks, it is only sap, she'd told herself, the red sap that flows inside these Weirwoods. But her eyes were unconvinced, seeing was believing, and what they saw was frozen blood. In light of which, it's interesting when, having consumed his paste, Bran finally begins to tap into the Weirnet and witnesses this vision through the Winterfell heart tree from a bygone era. It says, Then as he watched, a bearded man forced a captive down onto his knees before the heart tree. A white-haired woman stepped toward them through a drift of dark red leaves, a bronze sickle in her hand. No, said Bran, no, don't. But they could not hear him, no more than his father had. The woman grabbed the captive by the hair, hooked the sickle round his throat, and slashed. And through the mist of centuries, the broken boy could only watch as the man's feet drummed against the earth. But as his life flowed out of him in a red tide, Brandon Stark could taste the blood. And this is not the only evidence of blood sacrifices being made to weirwoods. There's mention in the world book of the children of the forest sacrificing to the old gods on the Isle of Faces. And when Davos Seaworth is imprisoned in the wolf's den, the old jailer Sir Bartimus tells him that Brandon Isai Stark once hung the entrails of slavers from the branches of the weirwood there as an offering to the old gods. So the reader is left to ponder whether the blood sacrifice in Bran's vision aided the process of awakening the heart tree, given each vision is going back in time, and this is the last vision he sees through that tree. Could this be the grim truth of the weirwoods? Do they need a dose of sacrificial blood in their roots to come alive? Is there another layer to the personification of these trees? Certainly, that could explain the bloody quality to the red sap. It would also explain why the passage and chapter ends with Bran's sensation of tasting the sacrificed captive's blood. And it's worth rewinding a little to consider how this burst of visions began, because we get some great insight into the mechanics of green seeing. Close your eyes, said the three-eyed crow. Slip your skin as you do when you join with summer, but this time go into the roots instead. Follow them up through the earth to the trees upon the hill and tell me what you see. Bran closed his eyes and slipped free of his skin. Into the roots, he thought, into the weirwood. Become the tree. For an instant, he could see the cavern in its black mantle, could hear the river rushing by below. Then, all at once, he was back home again. So Bran's maiden green-seeing voyage begins with him essentially skin-changing the Winterfell heart tree, not the tree over their heads, as his mentor had instructed. Instead of slipping into an animal, Bran goes into the roots, and from there he has access to the weirnet. When Varamyr Sixskins dies, he eventually ends up living a second life, his spirit essentially inhabiting the mind of his wolf, One-Eye. But for a brief flash, he seems to have skin-changed a weirwood, as Bran does here. It says, The white world turned and fell away. For a moment, it was as if he were inside the weirwood, gazing out through carved red eyes. This makes us wonder if Varamir, already established as a master skin changer, actually had green-seeing abilities that were never developed and only came to the fore briefly in those desperate throes of his physical death. And knowing now that a skin changer can inhabit a tree, we might also wonder about the mechanics of the others and their icy whites. Are the others, as we've suggested, simply mass skin-changing the dead? Could that be the correct description of their necromancy powers? 
having seen Bran change into Hodor, then a weirwood, it seems logical that the others are using a similar mechanism for their whites. Altogether, there's plenty of food for thoughts on the subjects of weirwoods, green seeing, and skin changing. George has imbued his world with this green magic, which, as far as magic goes, seems believable, with a deep, well-considered logic behind it. It's woven into the history and world-building deftly as an organic magic that provides intrigue and excitement, as well as juicy storytelling opportunities. And so, up next, we're going to round out the episode with a quick look at a child-adjacent crackpot, as well as the impact of those who sing the Song of Earth and green magics on the plot of A Song of Ice and Fire. You will never walk again, the three-eyed crow had promised, but you will fly. Sometimes the sound of song would drift up from someplace far below, The children of the forest, old man would have called the singers. But those who sing the song of earth was their own name for themselves, in the true tongue that no human man could speak. The ravens could speak it, though. Their small black eyes were full of secrets, and they would caw at him and peck at his skin when they heard the songs. At the beginning of the episode, we compared the children of the forest to dragons and the others as the trio of fantasy species at the fore of A Song of Ice and Fire. While we see the others in the opening chapter of the first book and dragons in the closing chapter, it's not until A Dance with Dragons that we actually see the children. So why are we suggesting they have a similar effect on the story with their icy and fiery counterparts? To begin with, let's take a look at the children of the forest in the current story and eventually assess their impact. We'll start with that cave in the far north, where there are at least 60 singers dedicated to serving Bloodraven, who they think of as the last Greenseer. It's important to note, however, that while Bloodraven may be the last, he's not the only Greenseer, as Bran discovers when he goes adventuring in Hodor's body. It says... He even crossed the slender stone bridge that arched over the abyss and discovered more passages and chambers on the far side. One was full of singers, enthroned like Brynden in nests of weirwood roots that wove through and under and around their bodies. Most of them looked dead to him, but as he crossed in front of them, their eyes would open and follow the light of his torch, and one of them opened and closed a wrinkled mouth as if he were trying to speak. So a room full of inconceivably ancient green seers whose life forces seem to be slowly being absorbed by the trees certainly adds to the total of singers in that location. We've mentioned Leaf, the one we get the most information about, and who is the only singer in the cave who can speak the common tongue, making it easier for George to convey personal details. Leaf tells Mira how and why she came to learn their language and fills in some additional details about herself and the life expectancy of her people. For him, the Bran boy, I was born in the time of the dragon and for 200 years I've walked the world of men to watch and listen and learn. I might be walking still, but my legs were sore and my heart was weary, so I turned my feet for home. So Leaf is a vital part of the story, because without her there would be no other way of communicating the point of view of her species. She is experienced and wise and has and will continue to offer a unique perspective which allows a deeper understanding of the singers as well as allowing those cave scenes to work on page with this avenue of communication. We're left to wonder which Targaryens were in power when she was walking the world of men. Around 200 years ago, we're looking at Jaehaerys, with House Targaryen still being in its dragon-riding age. Isn't it exciting to know that there was a child of the forest watching and experiencing the human world somewhere? It'd be interesting to know what she got up to and where she went, and we hope for some insight and anecdotes in The Winds of Winter. Yeah, we're dying to know more, but as we mentioned, Leaf has companions. It says the caves were home to more than three score living singers. 
And while they might not have the worldly experience Leif has and can't articulate themselves in the common tongue, we should not forget them. Of course, we don't even know their real names because, as Leif points out, all the names, including her own, are too long for humans to understand, and so Bran and Mira have to get creative. First, there's Snowy Locks, who serves the weirwood paste to Bran in this passage. She beckoned, and another of the singers padded forward, the white-haired one that Mira had named Snowy Locks. She had a weirwood bowl in her hands, carved with a dozen faces, like the ones the heart trees wore. Then there's Black Knife, whose nickname is surely a reference to the obsidian blades the children are known to use. And among the dozens of others, there are three they nickname Coles, Ash, and Scales. Like we said, Leaf seems to be the most significant here, but who knows what will happen in the cave going forward. And so there's every chance that these currently peripheral characters will have a role to play in the plot. And there's one other character we discussed earlier who might be related to the Children of the Forest. We presented the case for the ghost of High Heart being a hybrid child slash human, and if that's the case, it's interesting to consider the monumental mark she's left on this story. Yeah, in A Dance with Dragons, Sir Barristan tries to educate Daenerys on her family history and tells her, I saw your father and your mother wed as well. Forgive me, but there was no fondness there, and the realm paid dearly for that, my queen. Why did they wed if they did not love each other? Your grandsire commanded it. A woods witch had told him that the prince that was promised would be born of their line. A woods witch. Danny was astonished. She came to court with Jenny of Old Stones, a stunted thing, grotesque to look upon. A dwarf, most people said, though dear to Lady Jenny, who always claimed that she was one of the children of the forest. So, Jenny of Oldstones was clearly of the opinion that her dear friend was related to the children, perhaps one of the biggest clues in support of this notion. And while Barristan believes that the woman died in the Inferno at Summerhall, it seems clear that the Woods Witch survived and is now known as the Ghost of High Heart. The detail that she prophesied that the prince that was promised would come from the Ares plus Riella line is highly significant, as Jaehaerys promptly had them marry, remembering that House Targaryen is inextricably linked with that prophecy. And the ghost prediction apparently later fed into Ares and Riella's son's prophecy obsession, as Rhaegar Targaryen at first believed himself to be the promised prince. And we find it highly likely that the prophecy later influenced Rhaegar's decision to elope with Lyanna Stark, which of course provided an integral spark for Robert's rebellion and led to the conception of Jon Snow. And so, what a massive imprint on the story the Ghost of High Heart has had, and all because of the prophetic dreams she experiences, which she says in A Storm of Swords come from the Old Gods. Her visions and prophecies in the current timeline seem to be less momentous, but it's clear that the Brotherhood value her talents, and as we see in the dreams Aya hears her relate, she's very accurate, and the BWB certainly do act on what she tells them, including deciding not to take Aya to Riverrun when the ghost tells them her mother and brother have departed. That leads to Aya running away, being caught by Sandor Clegane, and eventually leaving Westeros altogether, the next necessary step in her own destiny directly influenced by the ghost's dreaming. And on the subject of her origins, we can't help thinking of Leif's comments that, quote, for 200 years I walked the world of men. Could it be possible that Leif is, in fact, the ghost of High Heart's mother? Given our discussion on interbreeding and magical bloodlines, could Leif have made it with a human? And to take this theorizing a step further into crackpot territory noting that both Bloodraven and the Ghost of High Heart are both albinos with distinctive white skin and hair and red eyes. Could Bloodraven be her father? Perhaps he encountered Leaf while she was walking in the world of men and he was undergoing his own journey of learning the art of creed seeing. This might explain the ghost's location relatively close to the Blackwood lands of Brynden River's first men maternal family, as well as why he later sought out the cave in the far north where Leaf had retreated when her legs were sore and her heart weary. 
and there's always the possibility that they acted according to some glimpse of the future and were attempting to fulfill the expectations of destiny. Well, that's a lot of crackpot to take in. And although we're not necessarily sold on any of this, these are interesting ideas floating around the fandom, which we'll leave for you to evaluate. Regardless of these crackpots, it's easy to see how the ghost of High Heart, as an odd character who rolls in and out of the plot, has actually left this massive imprint on the story. And so, even with scant on-page appearances, we can conclude that the Children of the Forest are an integral part of this story. While they are now central to Bran's arc and the isolation of their cave, their mark on the greater story is so pervasive it's impossible to imagine A Song of Ice and Fire without their influence, especially when we consider the angle of their connection to Bloodraven and possible connection with the others. They've literally shaped the continent of Westeros with the Hammer of the Waters, and their relationship with the Weirwoods and the Old Gods is woven through the fabric of the story and its world-building, and the locations themselves. Yeah, despite their physical absence on page, their mark is everywhere, and so their inclusion alongside the Others and Dragons seems wholly appropriate. In conclusion, we salute the singers who sing the Song of Earth, and we wait with bated breath to learn more about their culture and history, those mysterious green men on the Isle of Faces, and what impact the old gods, skin changing, and green seeing will have on the future of Westeros. Thanks so much for joining us today for this episode all about the Children of the Forest. And now it's time to give credit where credit is due. Thanks to George R.R. R. Martin for writing Those Who Sing the Song of Earth. And thanks to Kevin MacLeod and Kai Engel for allowing us to use their music in our production. And as usual, we'll end today with thanks for our patrons from the Castle Steel level. If you enjoy the podcast, consider being a patron and you could be hearing your name here too. Our heartfelt thanks to Atori Loon, AJ, Aegon VI, Alex, Ali B, Ali C, Ashinat Yara, Oakenfist, Brand the Builder, Brian, Camille, Casey, Charitable Rereadings, Chris, Christian, Maddie and Jessica, Sir Clint the Andal, Sir Duncan Cole, Convenience or Death, Courtney, David, Dimitri B, Dennis, Lady Diana Dane, Esme, Liz, Emily of the Erie, Evan, Ezra, Felix, Sir Gage, Armorer of Castle Greyguard, Sir Gladworth, Sir Gregor the Toasty, Lord of the Breadfort, History of Westeros, Isaac, Jim McGeehan, Winter's King, John Aris, Rider of the Ice Dragon, Cenarion, the White Storm, Julie Beth Tarth, Judson, Archmaester June, Healer of the Lesser Poxes, Katie, Lady Kelly, Mistress of the Old Bay of Crabs, Tree Girl, Sir Galahu of what? Lena Snow, known as the Twilight Star, Lemba, Lomas Knight Rider, Survivor of the Yeen Sleepover, Nessie the Questing Beast, Mage Marmot, Monero Geek TV, Maria, Margareta, and our cohort of Matts, Matt A, Matt C, Matt K, Matt L, Matt M, Matt R, as well as Beatrix Rainfall, Maester Mary, Anime Lover Nicole, Nimble Nick One Irick, Patrick, Peter Pebble, PJ, Paul B, Paul H, Peter, King Ray, first of his name, Richard, Sam, Sarah, Sean, Sir Swift, the peppered knight from the House of Black and Grey, Sheila, Cern, that shiny bastard, the Rat Chef de Cuisine, Terry, Sir Terence, Knight of the Cedars, Hema Helmuth, the Sellsword Sentinel, Valen Valentine, Maiden of the Black Frost, Quarren Halfhand, and Yvonne. As always, let us know if I've pronounced any of your names wrong, if you have a nickname you'd prefer to use, or if you feel we've left anything out. Visit RadioWesteros.com for quick access to all our podcasts. You can also find a link to our Patreon campaign, donate via PayPal or Coffee, and comment on our content there. Or find us on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. And of course, you can connect with us via Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, or email. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you soon with a new episode. Bye for now.